So welcome to the Let's Talk uh, COVID series. This, this is a series that was um, started by the CARE-NA chapter to provide uh, a forum for our nurse anesthetists to get continuous medical education. We are hosted by the National Nurses Association of Kenya, which brings together all nurses and midwives working within our borders. Um, the National Nurses Association of Kenya is a, an association that is meant to promote excellence in nursing profession in the country. The KRNA chapter um, brings together all nurse anesthetists practicing in Kenya and our goal, one of our goals is to promote continuous professional development for our members, hence the reason for events like this. This year we were meant to host the first Pan-African Nurse Anesthetist Conference, in short it's PANAC, which was to be held in July, but because of COVID we have had to uh, postpone it to next year. So I hope you all will take note of our contacts and, and please uh, follow us for news about this event. We hope to see you all in person in 2021. So this series today is sponsored by uh, Philips and we will they will be sharing some of their how, how to manage uh, ventilation using some of their products but we will largely focus on clinical management so uh, get ready to learn there's a lot to learn today and use the q and a box for any questions you might have during the sessions so this is the sixth episode of this series the focus for today is oxygen therapy and ventilation for COVID positive patients in the ICU. We have three presenters, a, a, a powerful female team, and I'm very happy to introduce them. One of them is uh, Chikati Faith, who is a KRNA working in AIC Kijabe Hospital. She's actually joining us from her workstation, and I'm not sure whether she's She's with us live. She was still finish up, finishing up some work. So I'm sure she'll be joining us in, in due course. The second panelist is Kadi Hamisi from MTRH Eldoret. So Kadi, you can wave to the crowd. <laughs> so that is Miss Hamisi from Eldoret. She's also a Kenya registered nurse anesthetist. And our last panelist is Agnes Hamisi who is a critical care nurse, who works with the Philips Limited. Um, she'll also be one of our panelists today. So this powerful team will take us through the presentation and I'll hand it over to uh, Kadi to start the session for us. So Karibuni Sana, please remember any question you have, use the Q&A box. Thank you. Kadi, please unmute yourself. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this day's presentation. We're going to go through the oxygen therapy and ventilation for COVID positive patients in ICU. And we have an outline for our presentation. We're going to go through, I'll do the case presentation from MTRH, and then we'll have. Um, Chikati taking us through the respiratory complexities of COVID-19. And uh, lastly, Agnes will finish with modalities to improve oxygenation and ventilation in COVID-19 patients in the ICU. So without further much ado, I'd like to also take this opportunity to welcome everyone who has joined us, especially those who are joining us from MTRH and they are not anesthetists all those who are nurses, including also our CEO, who is also with us today. So, Karibuni Sana, and let's continue. <laughs> so, picture with me this patient who came in to referral as a 36-year-old female. Let's call her Mrs. BMV. She came in with a history of uh, two previous scars, and she was in labor at 36 weeks of gestation. 
And also, she was a patient who has been on follow-up with rheumatic heart disease. Mm. At that time, she was complaining of uh, low abdominal pains. She had fever. She had generalized weakness, chest discomfort, and more so, also had shortness of breath that she had experienced for the past three days. Uh, I've mentioned that she was a known rheumatic heart disease patient, and that was diagnosed in the year 2000. And she was receiving medications, that is IM benzathine penicillin, monthly injection, junior aspirin, and also prednisone. She did not have any known food or drug allergies. And she had undergone two caesarean sections in the past, one in 2012 under general anesthesia due to CPD, and the second one was done in 2016 under spinal anesthesia due to declining to trial of SCAR. She appeared to be a very sick patient in obvious labor. Her GCS was 15 over 15. Respiratory-wise, um, she was breathing with difficulty using her accessory muscles. Her, her respiratory rate was above 30. Uh, on auscultation of the lungs, she had uh, bibacillar crepitations on the basis of the lungs. Uh, also, on auscultation of the cardiovascular system, you could hear audible murmurs, and uh, uh, her pulse rate was 128, and she also had visible palpitations. Her airway examination was unremarkable, and those were the vitals as shown there. Of importance to note from that slide is that this patient was actually having an increased work of breathing, uh, an, increased, an increased work of breathing. So samples were taken for lab investigations, a full hemogram was done, UECs were also taken and those were the results as projected. And at that particular time, because of the increased work of breathing and what she had, we also thought about taking COVID-19 samples. And it has also become a routine for patients coming to theater in our facility for them to have COVID-19 tests taken. From the chest x-ray that was done, she was exhibiting opacities on the lower, on the lower lungs. And that is, uh, she also had pulmonary congestion and she also had cardiomegaly. The ECG picture, she had T-wave inversions with uh, features of pericarditis. From the echo, her ejection fraction was at 46%. And uh, the valves, both aortic and mitral, she, she had val valvular abnormalities. Of importance to note there, she had mitral stenosis and the and the cardiac dilatation. So the impression that was made at that particular time by the anesthetist was uh, ASA classification three, malampati one with uh, rheumatic heart disease in preterm labor. And at this particular time, I'd also want you to tell me from in the chat box, if you're still with me, what other diagnosis do you think this patient could be having other than what the clinician who reviewed this patient saw? So very quickly, maybe the participants, you can give me differential diagnosis that you think this patient was exhibiting. Are we together? Are people there? So I see one yes, chronic yeah. chest infection from Abdullah Bell Bello. Mm -hmm. Chest infection. Actually, you are muted. So I see. Uh, I've seen an answer from Abdullahi, a uh, chronic chest infection. There is another answer also from um, Jeremiah. 
uh, from Japheth Asila, and uh, he says, possible COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh-huh. So other possible differential diagnosis that this patient could be having probably could be in congestive heart failure, could be in an active MI or PE. Susan Sue Anang has said that congestive cardiac failure or uh, pulmonary emboli. Uh -huh. The patient could also be having infective endocarditis or it could just be a mother who is just in labor. And lastly, COVID-19. Thank you for your responses. So after the diagnosis was made, then we had to initiate management of this patient. And because she was in obvious respiratory distress, oxygen via face mask was started. A decision to have an emergency cesarean section was also made considering that this patient was a two previous scar and she was in active labor. And then we had to decide on the choice of anesthesia to use, comparing maybe spinal versus general anesthesia. And for this patient, just to mention that uh, the kind of anesthesia that was used was epidural, because if you went with spinal, um, okay. The choice of anesthesia that was used at that particular time was epidural anesthesia. Uh, considering that she had an ejection fraction of 46 and also to try and avoid aerosols during anesthesia uh, 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 for general anesthesia that one um, okay fine that was done and then postoperative management on day one after the surgery went on well and the patient was, was taken back to the ward, she was admitted in the isolation ward because of that suspicion of uh, COVID-19. But while in the ward there, she developed uh, severe respiratory distress. She went into confusion. She was very febrile and her hypoxemia was worsening. Despite oxygenation, she was saturating at uh, 80% and uh, below. So at that particular point, internal medicine consult was requested and also the ICU team and unanimously they made a decision to intubate this patient early. And therefore, when they decided to ventilate the patient, the ventilator settings that were put at that particular time, the patient was put on SIMV mode volume control at a respiratory rate of 12 to 16, an IE ratio of 1 to 2, and a PIP of 5 to 20. Mm -hmm. And uh, COVID results were brought back, and they were positive. An arterial blood gas was also asked, was also requested, and it showed an alkalotic picture. The pH was 7.4 with partial carbon dioxide PCO2s of 49. As of today, the patient is doing day three and is on, on the ventilator. So that is how our patient, uh, uh, our patient presented. And we learned a few things from that patient. At MTRH, we have a high index of suspicion for COVID since the, the, the pandemic started. Unfortunately, we have a multidisciplinary approach uh, to managing this patient and therefore they are able, patient, our patients are able to get management very quickly and we were able to make quick decisions to assist the patient. And then the availability of our isolation center at our facility also help us to be able to nurse this patient safely, both for the, pay, for, for the health workers and also to the patients, not to expose other patients to, to COVID-19. Okay, so uh, that's how our patient presented. And uh, at this particular point, maybe I should just take you through the pathophysiology of COVID-19 just uh, very quickly. 
Mm. So as we know it, COVID-19 was first recognized in Wuhan, China in December 2019 as a respiratory tract infection that uh, was caused by a newly emergent coronavirus that is SARS-CoV-2 and it spreads by a droplet infection um, and you get it by direct contact with the infected patient. The average incubation period is 1 to 14 days and the symptoms occur any time from day 5. So what happens is the S protein on the surface of the virus usually reacts to the molecules of the ACE2 receptors in the lungs and then the ACE2 receptors alveolar epithelial cells, uh, the, the ones that they react with is usually the type that is pneumocystis, that, that's the type 2. And after an infection, viral replication occurs in the cells of the respiratory and interstitial epithelial leading to cytopathic changes and clinical symptoms. Um, up to, up to until recently, this is, the, this is what has been used to do to make up the diagnosis, but probably not anymore because the history of travel is not really relevant. We are told that COVID is already here with us, it is in the community. And therefore, if you come into contact with a patient who has COVID-19 confirmed by CPCR, these people could be symptomatic or they could be asymptomatic. And there are people who are in our immediate surroundings, such as they could be family members, they could be our workmates, they could be patients that you are serving. Uh, if you come into contact with these patients, somebody who has been exposed to COVID and has tested positive, then we'll, you will also contact the virus. Uh, and also, um, you can diagnose the patient of having COVID from the group, this group A symptoms and this group B symptoms. On the group B symptoms, patient could appear with fever or respiratory symptoms. But this is no longer the case anymore because we are told even patients who have GI symptoms or even having lost their tests, buds. So it could appear like anything. But of importance to note here is that if a patient has like one, one of the group A symptoms together with other two or three symptoms from group B, then you could do the COVID test and they would turn probably positive. Uh, laboratory findings could bring a picture of anything. Anything could give us leukopenia. Anything could increase the liver enzymes or myoglobin. But in addition to those symptoms that you have seen in the previous slide, and then you have positive laboratory findings of what we are seeing here, then you'd be able to come to a conclusion of the COVID, uh, COVID diagnosis. Uh, we could also do radiology tests, and the best would, have, would be to have a lung ultrasound on the bedside of the patient. Uh, if your facility is, if you're capable of doing this, this would be nice. Not all, everyone, everyone can do a CT scan, but then you realize when you do the radiology that uh, the patient will exhibit respiratory changes bilaterally. In the early stages of the disease, you will find out that the patient has patchy uh, opacities, patchy ground glass opacities uh, in interstitial changes. And then as the disease progresses, the opacities become more regular and round. And then um, in the severe disease, a patient could appear with pleural effusion. And this is very characteristic of uh, COVID-19. So I will stop there and allow my colleague to continue from, the, from there. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Faith. I'm going to take us through the clinical course of COVID-19 
and uh, oxygenation. Um, so most patients will present with mild symptoms. That's commonly fever, dry cough, fatigue, muscle pain, and less commonly with sore throat, a runny nose, diarrhea, or hemoptysis. But for those who present with a severe form of the disease, after one week of having these mild symptoms, they rapidly deteriorate and present with uh, hypoxic respiratory failure symptoms. The most notable are that the patient could come in with acute pneumonia, RDS, or sepsis, and septic shock. Um, it's also been reported that there is pulmonary microvascular thrombosis and PEs that could uh, develop with severe disease as well as organ failure. Um, next slide. So this is a common picture of uh, how RDS looks like. I'd like, like us to dwell on it just a bit. So um, if Gatiri, you'd um, maybe move to the next slide then back to the one I'm using. As you can see, the slide on the, okay, my right, COVID-19 RDS has more, thank you Gatiri, it's more diffuse. You can hardly see any lung area compared to um, normal pneumonia. It's not normal, but pneumonia. Um, Gatiri, go back to the previous slide, please. Yeah, so RDS is a life-threatening complication of COVID-19 and it mostly presents in older adults, patients with immune disorders and those with comorbidities. So um, these patients have diffuse lung inflammation and increased permeability leading to interstitial edema, as well as non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, atelectasis and fibrosis. Physiologically, these patients have a high shunt fraction and increased dead space, as well as reduced lung compliance. At this point, I'd like to mention that um, there are some countries that have identified two types of COVID. There's a type A and a type B. But most COVID associated, I mean RDS, sorry, most COVID associated RDS does not present with poor lung compliance. Most of them have um, a high lung compliance. Okay, next slide. So of these patients, 5 to 20 percent of uh, hospital, hospital, hospitalized patients uh, are admitted into ICU with a mortality of between 26 to 61.5. This is data according to the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists. Um, nearly all ICU patients will present with respiratory failure, and up to 88% of them will be managed invasively with mechanical ventilation. Um, next. So these are the criteria you could consider so as to ad admit a patient, a COVID patient into ICU. Um, if I'd like us to mostly focus on uh, the right, the need for mechanical ventilation, vasopressor support, if you have a respiratory rate more than 25, a, a partial pressure less than 50, PO2, FiO2 ratio of less than 150, those patients ought to be considered as um, legible for ICU admission. Uh-huh, next. So once your patient is in ICU, um, your goals are to maintain your SpO2s above 90%. You need your FiO2s to remain less than 60%. That's the oxygen that you administer to the patient. The flows need to be, the oxygen concentration needs to be less than 60%. Um, if possible, Usually we start at around 100. Agnes is going to elaborate further on that. And then we titrate slowly to below 60. Then the third goal is to avoid hemodynamic compromise by using PIP judiciously. Usually we start at five centimeters of water, then um, titrate as per the FiO2. Agnes will look into that. Um, so in our setting and more settings actually, um, the, most the most available monitor would be the pulse oximetry. So you need to confirm hypoxia using the pulse oximeter. If your SpO2s are less than 90%, you need to start supplementary oxygenation with either um, a nasal catheter, face mask, 
nasal cannula. For patients with pneumonia, you start at higher uh, lows. That's five liters per minute. And then gradually titrate against the SpO2s. Again, we're still maintaining our oxygenation, our SpO2s above 90%. For children with obstructive airway issues, you need it above 94%. For pregnant patients, you need it at 92 to 95%. Okay. Um, available to most of us are these oxygenation, oxygen delivery devices. And uh, your choice of which device to use will depend on the FIO2s you want to achieve, as well as the availability of these devices. So if, if probably you want to raise your FIO2s very fast, you go for the reservoir, the non-rebreathing mask, the Venturi mask, so that your FIO2s can go up faster. Um, next, please. So in addition to supplementing oxygen, there are various modalities that help in improving oxygenation of the patient. The basic ones would be you treat the underlying cause. Is the patient febrile? Take care of the fever. Do they have a congestive heart failure? Treat that. The next would be to increase the FiO2, keeping in mind that FiO2s above 60 um, have an increased risk of causing oxygen toxicity. Then the other thing is you could increase your, your PEEP, keeping in mind the hemodynamic stability of the patient as well as the FiO2. Um, the other thing you could do is uh, recruitment maneuvers whereby you subject the patient, uh, how do I put this, the airway to pressures of between 35 to 40 for about 30 seconds. You could also do inverse ratio ventilation. Um, so usually like we, we set our in IE ratios at one is to two. So you could invert them and give an inspiration at for two seconds and expiration at one, two is to one. That is what inverse ratio ventilation means. The other thing you could do is uh, treat fever, sedate, or start a neuromuscular blockade infusion that is paralyzing the patient. That will deal, dwell on so much that is being used currently for COVID patients would be prone positioning. Um, the complex rescue methods may not be available to all of us. They're limited to expert centers with technical expertise. I'm not sure about their availability to us. So we'll focus on the basic methods and the simple rescue methods for now. So let's talk a bit about proning. Um, for COVID patients, studies have emphasized early consideration of proning the patient. As soon as you discover that your patient has COVID, 19, start prone positioning as early as possible, targeting 12 to 16 hours per day. The supine position has been associated with, okay, overinflation of the ventral alveoli, atelectasis of the dorsal alveoli, um, compression of the alveoli by, by the diaphragm as it's being pushed up by the abdominal organs. So these patients will have they'll have even more hypoxia. Um, next slide. So prone position is preferred because um, COVID-19 tends to affect the dorsal and peripheral lung. So once you turn the patient prone, blood will be redistributed towards the better ventilated ventral lung unit. So, um, uh, the ven ventilation in the dorsal areas will also be improved and hypoxia will be resolved. Most of the time, their partial pressures of oxygen go up. And uh, we, we talked about interstitial edema as a consequence of ARDS. By proning the patient, there's better drainage of secretions and the edema is also resolved. In addition, it does not really require any specialist or additional equipment, just vigilance and a dedicated team to monitor the patient. Next. Um, indications, as we have mentioned, um, a confirmed or suspected COVID-19 patient, and if your PaO2, FiO2 ratios are below 150. Your absolute con contraindications are if you have an unstable spinal injury, if you have chest injury, uh, altered mental state, if your hemodynamics are compromised, 
or if there's a need for immediate intubation, um, look for other modalities via away from um, front positioning. Next. So once your patient is prone, you need to monitor them for about 15 minutes. If you are satisfied with your SPO2s as per the goals, that is above 90 or 92 to 96, remain prone. Um, the, the position needs to be changed every one to two hours. You can alternate front position with right lateral, left lateral, and a semi-recumbent position, whereby the patient is propped up 30 to 60 degrees upright. By the end of the day, you need to make sure that your patient has at least 12 to 16 hours of prone positioning. Okay, next. Um, some of the adverse effects of uh, prone positioning include accidental removal of the tubes. So uh, an intensivist or an anesthetist or someone who can take charge of the airway needs to be at the head of the bed as we are turning the patient. Then it's, while CPR can be done when the patient is prone, it is uh, rather difficult. The other thing would be facial edema and uh, of note, hemodynamic instability. Then because it's uncomfortable, most patients will require more sedative or paralytic agent. Okay. Um, if your SPO2 is deteriorating, first thing to do, always check your circuit, increase your FiO2 and change position. If um, the patient is not improving in prone position, um, consider going back to supine position with the patient propped up at 30 to 60 degrees. Yes. Uh-huh. Next. Yeah. So at this point, I'm going to let Agnes take over ventilation and oxygenation in the ICU. Thank you very much, uh, Kadi and uh, Chikati, for bringing us this far in this presentation. And it gives me the pleasure to just to review the challenges we've had in mechanical ventilation since we had about um, this uh, COVID-19 disease from last year. And I think as a country, we started getting worried about this uh, disease uh, very early in the year, but we thought it was very distant until it came just close to us. And the day that the first person was announced that uh, we have the first case in this country, that's when we realized we have a lot of problems as far as managing this patient is concerned. Moreover, we started looking at, do we have enough capacity as a country uh, to put them uh, to manage these patients? Do we have enough ICU beds? Uh, do we have enough resources? Do we have uh, resources in terms of the equipment that is required, in terms of the, um, uh, not just the equipment in terms of ventilators, but even PPEs? Do we have enough oxygen facilities? And all this, it was really a big issue and uh, still remains a big issue. And we saw lots of innovation coming through. Until now, we were asking ourselves, are we even equipped, are we even ready uh, as healthcare workers? Do we have the capacity to take care of these patients? And um, we know that it was quite a stressful time. And thanks to God that now we are getting somewhere because now we have learned from those that had this pandemic before us. And we have learned even to, to, uh, from the various webinars in this country and various training centers, uh, training opportunities we've had to learn what really is it that uh, is the problem. Now, when it first started, we knew, we were told that uh, um, we, we had, like in this country, many of us went to start now talking about um, then which would be the best modalities to do. We all went looking for ventilators and we got very innovative about ventilation. And we know in some countries, they even put ventilators in smaller units which are not critical care to be able to manage these patients. Fantastic, you have the patient, you have the equipment, but do you have the capacity in terms of managing ventilation in a non-ICU setup to manage this patient? So having come from that area, let us bring now, consolidate our thoughts all together and see what really uh, comes to, um, how then would we manage? The first and most important thing when you talk about COVID-19 and uh, vent, uh, oxygenation and ventilation is your first encounter with the patient. So you want to ask yourself, where is where, where am I as a clinical person meeting or encountering the patient with COVID-19? And what are the presenting symptoms that the patient has? Next slide, please, Katuri. So as we have heard from uh, the presenters before, a lot has been said about oxygen therapy. 
So as you find uh, come into contact with the possible or the patient that you're suspecting has um, COVID-19, you, first of all, you, the first thing you do, of course, is the assessment of the patient. And you want to ask yourself, when I assess this patient, what am I seeing? Is the patient breathing spontaneously? And if they're breathing spontaneously, what are the signs? Are they exhibiting an increased work of breathing? Or how is this patient presenting to me? And depending on where you classify the findings that you get on this patient, you will be able to follow on the continuum as shown on that slide there, whether you want to initiate oxygen therapy, as Chikati has very carefully spoke to us about, and she has clearly told us about the various uh, devices that we use for oxygen therapy and even to what percentage of FO2 that each oxygen uh, device can offer. Moreover, apart from this, a patient looking at how the patient presents to you, this continuum does not mean that you'll always start from basic oxygen therapy going all the way to invasive mechanical ventilation. Because in between, depending on what, how the patient is presenting, we find that we have to use high flow therapy, high flow uh, oxygen therapy on this patient, which was usually a reserve of the pediatric population, but now working um, more and more, finding more benefit even in the adult population. And we shall have a look at that in the next few slides. Or maybe at the time that I'm meeting this client, uh, uh, they, look, they look a little bit more sick. I could start with non-invasive ventilation. In non-invasive ventilation, you want to ask yourself, um, Am I going to use uh, a nasal um, cannula? Am I going to use a face mask? Am I going to use a full face mask? Where am I finding this patient? Because the device, again, used for non-invasive ventilation depends on the, on the evaluation that you've done on the patient, their SpO2, their respiratory rate, their work of breathing, and also very much so like how long do I anticipate that this patient will remain on an invasive ventilation? And by the time you're thinking of invasive ventilation, remember the patient who's with NIV is a conscious patient who's able to breathe on their own, maintain their, initiate their own breaths. They're able to um, uh, make their own adequate tidal volume when they breathe and uh, they, they're conscious. So basically you're able to manage them uh, because already they have an intrinsic effort of breathing. So they're quite okay. The moment you come to invasive ventilation, looking at a patient who's more sick, in this case. And the most important question in invasive ventilation you want to ask yourself is that yes, I've intubated this patient or I've used a trachea on this patient and I'm not talking about invasive therapy. Am I going to put this patient on um, um, maybe a, 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 a pressure mode of ventilation or am I going to put them on a volume mode of ventilation? But all this is, is telling us that where you find your patient then Will uh, the therapy that you initiate on that patient will depend on the continuum of their uh, presentation, how they're presenting, and at what point. So if I was like finding a patient who's very sick, it doesn't make sense for me to start from nasal cannulas and mask. I may need to start at a higher point where I start straight with invasive mechanical ventilation. Petri. So then, very quickly, um, I would like us to study this uh, slide. You can see that it is color coded, almost like the traffic lights. And that is why you're able to, uh, uh, to understand and also to remember very easily um, how, where do I classify my patient? And what criteria am I using to classify this patient in this area? What intervention am I going to give? And where am I placing this patient? One thing that COVID-19 brought is that very quickly, as we have had the patients that require uh, ICU with mechanical ventilation of the total population of COVID-19 is a maximum of 10%. Anything between 6 and 10% of the patients who get with COVID-19 will require uh, ICU therapy with invasive, uh, I mean with mechanical ventilation. So then how do you triage? How would you know which patient goes where first? So let's start with the green bullet. The green bullet here we're having a patient who has come maybe feeling a bit unwell, having a bit of chest uh, coughing or, or the symptoms that we read to us before. When we take the vital signs, we find that the respiratory rate is at less than 20, so maybe they're doing 16, 18. Uh, the saturation is about 94%. And basically, this is the patient who is fit for home care. So you send them home with instructions. Observe this, look at this, and if you feel like your breathing is becoming worse, then come back to us and we shall take care of you from that point with very clear instructions. Most of them are very uh, anxious and, and um, and uh, what we need to do is reassure them and give them at least uh, what we call um, health education messages and very much keep in contact with the healthcare workers, that in case 
they get sick, then they know when to come to hospital. So that they don't delay coming to hospital so quickly, uh, so, so much that when they come, they have already deteriorated. So the green button basically tells you the patient is breathing okay, saturating okay, he is good to go home. On the yellow button, this is a patient, of course, with, um, as you can see, the saturation now has dropped from 94 and it's trending between 90 to 94. It's just in between there. And when you look at the respiratory rate, the patient is uh, having a, a um, tachypnea of above 20. But when you commence oxygen therapy with the devices that, are, that Faith has spoken to us before, uh, anything to between 10 to 15 liters per minute, they respond very well. So they have no problem. This patient does not need to be in the ICU. So where do we take them? We take them to the general unit, the way you, you hear the COVID centers, uh, not necessarily um, a critical care place, but a place where they can be observed. It could be your general medicine unit and where we can house this patient for some time as we observe how they're responding to therapy and how they're coming around even from the disease process. Now, the orange button, we can see that something is happening here. Again, uh, still we have our saturations below 94. At this point, you find that most of them are doing a range of about 85 to 90 over SPO2. RR, of course, is above 20. And we say 20 here, of course, it's much, a bit much higher than that. Anything above 20. Uh, this category of the patients, we, we try to them in the orange uh, button there, are patients who we commenced oxygen therapy at 10 to 15 liters, but they did not, they're not responding very well to that therapy. So they require a higher intensity of management. So in this case, we, instead of putting them in the med surge unit, we'll put them in a slightly like a step down unit to the ICU, maybe like something close to a HDU or an acute care area. And in the acute care area, still, even in this uh, place, they will be taken care of by people who are not um, critical care, meaning not critical care nurses, not critical death doctors, not intensivists, because this category of specialists are busy with the ICU and the ICU probably is full. So this patient is sick, but is responding to CPAP therapy. And CPAP therapy um, uh, can be used either uh, with a nasal prong, as we know, or with a, with a, with a mask, oxygen or a nasal mask, or a full face mask, so long as the patient is comfortable, to, depending on how well they tolerate the device that they use. So then, what are we saying here? Patient is sick, um, did not respond to the earlier interventions of 10 to 3 liters of oxygen by a normal device. So then we're thinking, let's commence sip up. At least at uh, 10 centimeters of water of sip up, um, we can observe how they are doing. Now, let me just stop there a little bit and talk a bit about sip up in that when we heard about uh, CPAP with non-invasive ventilation, we found that in the earlier uh, communication that was coming through to us as uh, healthcare workers worldwide about uh, non-invasive therapy is that, oh, when a patient is having COVID-19, please do not put them on non-invasive therapy. Why? Because they all die. But why were they dying? And if they were dying, how was that statistic um, evaluated? What were you comparing? This patient, uh, this patient's category of patients too. Are you comparing them with the patients who are in the critical care unit or what category, what are you saying? So then uh, studies that are coming over and over are now actually saying that we should not deny a chance to a patient who can do well with non-invasive therapy by jumping straight to invasive mechanical ventilation simply because they have COVID. One of the main concerns is that people are saying that because of the nature of the device, either the full face mask or the oral nasal mask or the nasal prongs for um, non-invasive therapy or with a CPAP, they were saying that it is associated with a high rate of aerosolization. So when the patient coughs, it is easy that it comes to you. But then what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with COVID-19. So I would every, anybody would expect that if it's COVID-19, all the measures pertaining to infection control have been employed by the practitioner such that even if the patient was to cough out, even if the patient was to uh, sneeze, the healthcare worker is protected. There was a study done in the, uh, in the Lancet, it was published in the Lancet, and it was said that 70% of uh, the healthcare workers that worked in the step down units, like the one we're discussing here, and used non invasive ventilation, most of them, at least 70% of that staff, uh, contracted uh, COVID 19. But then, what are we seeing here? In modern day, and times, or rather even just before COVID, pre-COVID era, CPAP was not something that we would use naturally in a step-down unit. This patient will be somewhere 
whether it's a critical care personnel, either in the HD setup or a bit in the IC setup. Now, because the IC is full with invasive, uh, uh, patients with invasive mechanical ventilation, the patients that sit up are now being uh, attended to in the step down unit. So the people down there have been given a very quick training. They are not yet very well conversant with mechanical ventilation or even with CPAP. And now we are giving them that responsibility. They are also having an increased workload because now this is now COVID. And now we do not know how these people in ICU have dealt with the equipment. So even handling was an issue. So I'd suggest that you read that, read that article if you come across it and it's in one of our references, but you can be able to see what the problem with, uh, was at that time and why now the, the science now is changing to say we should not deny patients in category orange who can do well with non-invasive from getting non-invasive ventilation. Very good point, very good discussion about that. And there's a lot of that even on the other websites, even the critical care journals, American Critical Journal, you get a lot of information surrounding that. Now, having said that, um, what then? What, well, how then do we um, allow a patient to come into the critical care setup? Who is this patient who qualifies to come to the critical care setup? This is the patient who is very sick, has an increased work of breathing, severe hypoxemia, saturations, now we're talking of below 85, definitely, though I've written there 94 as per the guidelines. This basically WHO guidelines, you'll find a lot of that also on the WHO website. And um, the RR is a very tachycardic, and a very tachypnea, they have a, a tachypnea, tachycardic, requiring support for life, either with the uh, inotropes and other um, uh, life-saving measures. So therefore, remember this patient already is not responding to therapy with CPAP, is not responding to high flow nasal cannulas, uh, oxygenation. So already this, um, they're in rest failure, complete uh, rest failure, and uh, almost uh, rather partial rest failure. So what we need to do is now commence intubation with mechanical ventilation. Now, intubation and mechanical ventilation in critical care is like routine of what we have been doing all along. Now, the question is, when you look at uh, um, the outcomes, both from the step-down unit and from, uh, from critical care for patients who had non-invasive ventilation and patients with mechanical ventilation, surprise, surprise, there is no difference in uh, really the difference in outcomes of which therapy was used. But then they, they are now, the discussion now is uh, moving towards um, the fact that we should not have intubated unnecessarily, which is that with non-invasive ventilation. So it's still, we're still in the learning process, but in, at this point, this particular patient, because they're now in the high, uh, uh, high care area, which is a critical care unit, we need to give them intubation, we need to give them mechanical ventilation, and uh, the critical care team here, which is, who is the intensivist and the team, the critical care nurses, and very high skilled people are the ones now managing this patient. Now, suppose um, in centers where they have ECMO, they are utilizing it more and more. In Kenya, I think we have one center that has ECMO. Another center is looking at having ECMO, both of them in Nairobi. And um, we are going to see more and more of this kind of discussion um, coming over. And now maybe it is time for us. I know um, my colleagues before have said, yeah, where it's available, it's not available. It's now coming to us. And now that it's coming to us, our, our new um, study area would be now, let's look at the outcomes of patients who are receiving ECMO to, risk to treat uh, rest failure uh, in our critical care units. So that's just a good point to discuss. So if today um, you want to take home something, I would suggest that you can even take a screenshot of this, uh, of this uh, slide, so that you, when you get to the patient, you can ask yourself, where is this patient? Where am I going to uh, transfer this patient? In which unit of the hospital am I going to uh, take this patient to be taken care of? Gaturi? So now, so remember the first uh, slide we talked about oxygen therapy, went to HFT, went to NIV, and now uh, finally to uh, mechanical ventilation, invasive. But as you, managing this patient, you could follow something like an algorithm like this. And this algorithm tells you, um, this is where I am, this is what I'm observing, or what action should I take? So it takes, takes you step by step of assessment and treatment 
of the patient with COVID-19. So main thing as we have heard, we see that uh, the patient is coming in with um, COVID-19 with hypoxia. And uh, we ask ourselves, is this patient fit for intubation? Maybe no. If they're not uh, fit for intubation at this time, are they tolerating supplemental oxygen, 10 to 15 liters via face mask? Probably not. Then let me try high flow nasal cannulas. The good, um, the good thing is that right now we have, um, we have devices in the market, not just Philips, but devices in the market that um, allow us to switch between non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula without changing the equipment itself. So the only thing probably you will change is the device that you're connecting to the patient. So it's sometimes good to know that if you have this, then you can quickly switch um, to, to the other therapy that is effective for the patient without having to bring in a completely new equipment into the patient's room. So uh, if the patient is not tolerating high flow nasal cannula therapy, uh, is there a need for intubation and mechanical ventilation? If no, consider NIPPV. And if it's yes, then you go straight to intubation. This is all about elimination. It's about initiating the care when you most need it without further delay. That is key. It's very important. When whatever treatment you're giving to the patient, whether it is NIV, whether it is um, high flow therapy, what you need to ask yourself is within an hour, one and a half hours, what, what is my patient's response? Are they responding to the care that I'm giving or are they getting worse? So if you think, if you, if you assess and you feel your patient is not getting any better in terms of my SP2 is not improving, in terms of my RR for the patient is not improving, or um, in, uh, in terms of uh, the fact that uh, you want to, you, maybe the ETCO2 is, in, is, uh, is increasing, although we know that um, with this kind of patients, hypoxia is real, and that's one. So you, you ask yourself, these are the parameters that I'm having. I have given this therapy for the last one hour, for the last one and a half hours. Is my patient getting better or not? If they are not, do not hesitate to go up. If they are showing improvement within uh, a few hours, then you need to be able to de-escalate the care, start maybe coming down with the oxygen therapy, because we know that if every therapy that we give has, um, is, is a potential, can cause potential electrogenic uh, issues. Um, and therefore we need to be very careful with what we are giving uh, to the patient. All right, so next slide, Gaturi, please. So what are the main things that we need to remember from this discussion? Number one is that the WHO guidelines for the management of breast failure in COVID-19 use with CIP, uh, it highly recommends actually that we use CPAP and NIV for those patients who do not necessarily require invasive me mechanical ventilation. And they put a disclaimer there. You must use PPEs. So when you talk about aerosolization, your main, main, your main concern at this time is that you have a patient that, uh, I mean, if they cough, then you, you anticipate that they're going to transmit um, the disease and um, uh, through particulate matter, of course, and, and um, all that. So the question is, are we having the right um, PPEs? Are we following the protocol that has been given to us in terms of donning PPEs and how to remove them? Donning is one thing and also removing is another thing. So, so when you're, if you follow the right protocols that you are going into a COVID room and we know those of us who have worn that uh, equipment, it is not easy even for us to breathe in there. We feel suffocated sometimes. And I've seen more, more and more healthcare workers sitting down and saying, I am not able to move anymore. So at this time, it's better to allow that colleague to move um, out, uh, out, of, uh, out of the very critical area where the COVID patient is, maybe into a lesser room in the area. And if they cannot completely tolerate it, then allow them to go out. Actually, I see good practice in some of the, uh, of the hospitals, referral hospitals in Kenya today, um, in this town, whereby, um, I think they, they are all on shift, uh, as many as need to be on shift, but half of them are inside the unit and half are, are outside the unit. That means not outside, outside, but if this is the room where we are and this is the ICU, the side room on the other side, and, and uh, after maybe four or five hours, those ones will come in and these other, I mean, those, those other ones will come out and these ones will go into the unit. So that way they get regular breaks in between. Even so, People who are new to the uh, department, you find that they cannot tolerate the use of the PPEs. So it's a fine balance that we must obtain. And um, once we do that, then if you're feeling comfortable with the PPE yourself, then you're likely to take care of yourself, your colleagues, and also take care of the patient as need be. 
The second thing is you need a good interface. The problem with NIV, most of the time, uh, even with SIPAP devices, you find that maybe sizing, there's the element of sizing for most of the, um, uh, there's an element of sizing so that you can decide what mask you're going to use or what, uh, what size of the HF cannula you're going to use. So sometimes because of maybe in not uh, improper training or inadequate ad training, you find that uh, people just open and they find, oh, this is an NIV mask and they put it on there like it's leaking all over the place. But really, we failed at the point of trying to find the right size of the device. Because there's a way, if you're using, if I can just remove my spectacles for a bit, you need to be able to size a mask uh, right from the bridge of the nose to somewhere down here. There is no way that you can say NIV mask and then you put it to, from the eyes levels to down here. So this is the wrong way to size. You need to be able to know how to size so that you can be able to know uh, what it is. If it's above the nails, again, use the sizing tool to see how the nails is and that tells you if it's large, it's medium, it's small and all this. So this is all about having the right size of um, the device to use. Patuli, uh, please. Um, already, um, Chikati spoke to us about um, this slide in another uh, slide before. And she said that, uh, remember the, when you look, when she, she showed us the picture of the, of the two chest x-rays, there was one that was more of, um, what can I say? It was more of a, of a pneumonia picture and the other one was more of an ARDS picture. Now, um, again, when you look at the COVID-19 and you look at the division of uh, what they call the, uh, the phenotype of COVID-19, you find that there's one phenotype uh, that causes uh, pneumonia and there's another phenotype, which is the H phenotype that causes the ARDS. So basically your management of the patient in ICU in terms of what mechanical ventilation or how you're going to manage the ventilation for this particular patient depends on whether they're showing a pneumonic picture, which is the L type or the um, H type, which is the ARDS like picture on the chest X-ray. And the management of course uh, will depend on um, uh, will depend on where, uh, how this patient, uh, um, where the patient category falls. We are fond of algorithms in the critical care unit. Now, one thing that she talked to us about is the uh, partial pressure of oxygen versus uh, to the FO2 uh, ratio, which is called the PF ratio. And by looking at uh, where the patient falls in terms of calculation of the PF ratio, you can tell whether they have mild ARDS, moderate ARDS, or severe ARDS. Everything is by elimination. So the example I've given there is, for example, if you're giving, uh, your, you've done your blood gas analysis and you have your uh, ABGs with you, so you find that maybe the partial pressure of oxygen is at 70 millimeters of mercury, then, um, and maybe you're giving an FO2 of 80, so basically it's about, uh, it's supposed to be 70 divided by uh, 70 over 80, and you find that that gives you an, um, an outcome of about uh, 87.5 millimeters of mercury. If you take 87.5, uh, I mean 87.5 as a ratio, sorry. If you take 87.5 as a ratio and you bring it to the, um, to, the, to the category here, you want to ask yourself, so is the patient having um, severe ARDS, moderate ARDS or mild ARDS? So 87 is way below 100, so which means this particular patient with the FO2 that we're giving and the PO2 that they generate, uh, you're able to measure on ABG, uh, fall under the category of ARDS. So automatically this type of patient will require mechanical ventilation. If they're in early phase, maybe they just came into the unit. One problem we know is that with the, with the COVID-19, the problem we have is when they start deteriorating within four hours, a patient who was in the unit reading a newspaper, on simple nasal device with oxygen, in four hours can be completely in the ICU intubated, mechanically ventilated. So it's a rapid deterioration. So where you find this patient and uh, uh, looking at the PA2 FO2 ratio with ARDS, you can easily commence the right therapy. So it's all about um, what do you have available. Uh, preferably, most of the units like now where where we are, like in um, as a country, we are not where we were. Uh, where we didn't have lots of these things available. Yes, I do appreciate that we do not have ABGs in each and every unit, but I also want to appreciate the increase in the last few years, especially through the MES project. I want to appreciate that really now we have, a, we have an access to a blood gas analyze, uh, 
analyzing machine and be able to do some of these things. Next slide, please. So then, uh, this is now showing us the continuum again of uh, the oxygen devices. This has been spoken to us. We'll start with the high flow oxygen therapy on the extreme left uh, side. And you can see, um, basically, we have just the nasal cannula there. The patient is quite comfortable higher up there, looking like they're breathing at ease. And it's connected to a device that can give high flow oxygen therapy. Uh, preferably, also, you can see that uh, we have um, uh, the patient on CPAP can be on CPAP either with, um, with, a, with a mask or with a, or with a, um, or with a full face mask, with a full face mask or an, an, ox, an oral nasal uh, cannula, a bit oral nasal mask. And then uh, the other one is, uh, you may, some of us have heard about the helmet and have used the helmet in terms of oxygen therapy. So what we see here basically is that we have, uh, um, you could, because you could either use a full face, uh, full helmet uh, and give the oxygen therapy, but this device, which is called a full face mask also on the extreme right, is able to give you um, the same thing. Okay, Katuri? All right, so the key considerations basically is what we've talked about. You must adhere to the PPEs and then assess if it's high flow therapy, then we know that the comments usually at between 40 to 60 liters uh, of, of, uh, of flow, uh, of liters per minute of uh, oxygen flow and we're able to uh, manage that patient. Next slide, please, is um, about the CPAP. Again, don't delay care. If the patient is um, uh, not doing very well on HFT, give them to CPAP, and then to, uh, next slide, to the invasive ventilation. So hallmark, as I said, is look at where, what is your PAFO2 ratio. You'll be able to understand where to put the patient. Next slide. So, um, Yes, this is what we have been waiting for, for invasive mechanical ventilation. And uh, just very briefly, we know uh, when the patient is coming to us, we need to be able to, um, as I said, first of all, yes, we're going to commence mechanical ventilation and in, uh, invest intubation and mechanical ventilation. But what are the targets? The targets basically is to maintain an SPO2 between 90 to 24 and above if possible. Um, maintain a PO2 of 60 millimeters of mercury, uh, maintain um, a PCO2 of 7.3 and uh, FO2 of at least below 4, 0 0.4. So basically, those, that is the target. And to do that, choose a mode that you're most comfortable with. Nobody puts a gun to say start with this mode. If you start an FO, usually we start an FO2 of 1.0, but we quickly bring it down uh, depending on the SPO2 and the ATCO2 uh, SPO2 and how the patient is breathing. And uh, tidal volume normally is 8 to 10 mils per kg, but where we have ARDS and even in uh, COVID, we start at 6 mils per kg uh, body weight. Next slide, please. All right. So use less PIP, but of course with caution, of course with caution, um, you want to avoid, um, especially use PIP, especially when you have diffuse lung injury to maintain open alveoli, but don't over, overuse uh, oxygen and PIP because at the end of the day, you do not want to cause uh, parenchymal damage to the alveoli. Next slide. All right, and always ensure that your heel, uh, your peak, uh, peak, peak pressure, uh, plateau pressure, ensure your pressures remain at least below 30. In ARDS, and especially in COVID, we're using, using as, late, as low as uh, 28 centimeters of water. Next slide. All right, so any other care that require, refers to mechanical ventilation, any other care, that means everything pertaining to care of the patient with mechanical ventilation, we must be able to utilize. So it doesn't mean that this is COVID, now this is the much that we can do. We've only highlighted what is important for COVID, but every other care, nutrition, humidification, alarms and everything continues as per the normal. Katuri? Okay, and of course, uh, all the other care, of course, this one talks about uh, sedation, use sedation judiciously with paralysis, with or without paralysis, depending uh, on what your presenting factor is. Avoid um, steroidal and uh, steroidal uh, anti inflammatory drugs as much as possible. And um, if you have a problem, all inhaled medications, that is bronchodilator, should prefer be given by meter dose if the patient is doing it uh, by themselves. If not, we have enough budget in the ICU to be able to give the same things as well. 
So basically, uh, this is what we had for you. Um, just very quickly and very, um, just to show you the COVID response is that uh, we talked about ventilation. I don't know that you can see my, I'm holding something here. This in itself is a ventilator that we have. And basically, I've been able to divide it into two. I have the ventilator itself and I have the humidifier on this side. If I don't need the humidifier, I have the full ventilator here. All I need is a, um, a HME, take care of the humidifier. And this is a full working ventilator, the way it is. So this is what has been used a lot to give sip up in the lower areas. But in areas where you have also don't have a lot of skilled people, this is this ventilator can be taught even online. And people who are who need to use it can use it. It's very small, very portable, very interesting to look at. Um, looks like it's nothing, but this is a full ventilator. Thank you very much, people, and I wish you a blessed evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the presenters. I want to, uh, I, I know we, we, we've gone beyond uh, the time that we had agreed, but I think we can take a few minutes to go through a few questions. For the Kenyan uh, nurses who are with us on this platform, please take note of the CPD code there and use it to update uh, your CPD points online. And please note that the code expires on the 13th of this month. Uh, if you need a certificate, if you've made it to this section, please send us an email with your name um, to info at krna.org or you can please send me an email and then you can follow up on WhatsApp. But please, please send, send the email first. So we'll go straight to some of the questions. Um, uh, somebody asked, what is the rationale of using CPAP with no humidification? So um, my panelists who would want to answer that question. For, for everyone, please, the participants, if you continue to receive your questions, please put them on the chat. Thank you. Sorry, I disappeared for a minute. <laughs> so, but I'm back. So I don't know if that question was answered. What is the rationale of using CPAP with no humidification? Sorry, Gatori, can you come again with your question? What's Some the rationale of? Using CPAP with no humidification. Okay, now remember the use of humidification, purposely mechanical ventilation, is usually because we have bypassed uh, the normal anatomical features in terms of, um, um, like if I'm breathing in right now, the ciliary uh, uh, bodies, the, all this. So basically, as I get uh, the air gets in, it will be able to do the filtration of what does the particulate that needs to come out, and also. The, my normal anatomical features are able to make uh, the air more moist. So by the time you're going to uh, NIV, the patient is already breathing spontaneously. The anatomical features are intact. They do not require, usually most of them do not require um, um, humidification, but it is not contraindicated. You can utilize it. And most of the ventures have got a vent setting of how much humidification you want to give, uh, even with CPAP. So if you can still use it, but usually in normal essence, the patient is intact, that is just sufficient to go like that without uh, humidification. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll take one last question. How to go about referring a COVID-19 patient from one facility to another? 
is in respiratory distress and SpO2 is below 80. I do not know if anyone is familiar with our referral uh, procedures, especially in Kenya. Uh, maybe we allow the MTRH and Kijabi team to respond to this one, please. Thanks. <laughs> and it's okay to say we don't know. So maybe maybe we can uh, research on that, look at what policies are out there from a Ministry of Health, and maybe we can send uh, the answer to this question once we have that written feedback. Because I, as, at the moment, I have not heard of any past hospital referring patients with COVID because of the risks that come with uh, moving someone from one facility to another. So maybe let's look at that one and we shall give, um, we, we shall give a response on, to that question on email. So once again, thank you so much, guys, for uh, sending in your, uh, joining us for this session uh, and your comments. We've, we've have had very many positive comments on the chat box and I hope the panelists have had a chance to read through some of them. Uh, we are, we have our uh, chairman here with us, Mr. Samson. So I'll give you a few minutes to just Say hello to your team and give us a few words before we close. Thank you very much, Gatwe. I hope you can all hear me because I usually have very poor network reception. Today you're perfect. Okay. I think I really have to thank all our uh, participants and our, our, our representatives who have done a good work. Thank you, Faith, Agnes, and Cardi. We really appreciate as Kenya registered anesthetist. We also welcome and thanks NACOA president who have been always with us. Thank you very much, team. Next week, we still have our series, which we shall try to have, to have IFNA with us. And we expect our moderator to be NNAK chair, Wanobego. We, members of KRNA, thank you very much. Today we have the largest number. We appreciate all the team and we hope next week you will also attend. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Agnes, one of the things I've seen in the chat box is somebody asking the cost of that portable uh, ventilator. <laughs> So, it is really uh, affordable. <laughs> so, it's really affordable. You so can maybe give them my email address. Yes. So maybe is, for for all the people who've joined us on this uh, call, we'll send you uh, the the contact information for Agnes Hamisi. You can ask questions on how to get the machine and a little bit more about it. And and I'm sure even I've seen so from Ghana who has said uh, we are ahead in Kenya that we have that one. And I'm sure <laughs> they can also access it as far as Ghana. So uh, we shall yes. send all this information to you guys by email. Once again, thank you, Tim, for joining us for this session. Uh, and see you next Friday. Asante. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. <sighs> No, we are still on. So Agnes, when 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 my internet got I don't know what happened. It told you the host, so you don't want to end the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very strange. Okay. Yeah. So.
um, can we meet on on our on our group? Yes, yes. Sawa, sawa. Yes, we can meet. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> So let me end the meeting now.